and welcome to Banter, the official podcast of the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Phoebe Keller, the head of AEI's media department, and I'm here with AEI President Robert Doerr. We'll be your Banter co-hosts. Each week, we'll take you inside our think tank for conversations with leading policymakers and thinkers about today's pressing policy issues. Thanks for tuning in. Joining us today on Vanter is Rui Teixeira, who's one of our new scholars here at AEI, who studies political demography, voter turnout, American electoral politics, and party coalitions. Before joining us here at AEI, he was at the Center for American Progress and has worked at Brookings, the Progressive Policy Institute, and the Economic Policy Institute. He's the co-author of the very influential 2002 book, The Emerging Democratic Majority. And for us right now, he's writing a weekly analysis with Carlin Bowman of elections and demographic voting patterns in the lead up to midterms. Thanks for joining us, Rui. Delighted to be here. It's so great to have Rui with us. He's one of the scholars who joined AI in a flurry of activity this summer and got a lot of press about that. That yeah. was a nice thing. So thank you for that, Rui. We appreciate you getting us attention. Ah, and <laughs> My pleasure, you know. It's attention for me, too. So you know. well, yeah. there you yeah. go. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so we're going to this is going going to be released on Election Day. So let's not talk about the horse races and the individual Senate races, because that'll be all baked by then. But mm-hmm. the elections and our politics are influenced by big long term trends, which you are the foremost expert on. It seems to me. And so let's talk about long term trends or long term changes Mm -hmm. in the political choices of various groups. And so the one that you're frankly most identified with, at least recently, has been the working class. What has happened to the working class in their political attitudes? I mean, when I was a kid, the working class was the the Hubert Humphrey Democrats and uh, they don't seem to be that anymore. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, you know, almost no matter how you define the working class, whether it's by occupation. We have seen over time a drift away from the Democrats among working class voters, particularly, of course, among white working class voters, where that that move away from the Democrats goes back decades. But we've seen another tranche of this, as it were, in the last decade. So, If you look at 2012 and you compare it to 2016, when Trump got elected, um, there was a big, another big surge toward the Republicans among white working class voters. And that's really what delivered the election to Trump. It was the surge of those voters, particularly in key Midwest states that really delivered the election for him. He couldn't have won it without him. They really are the demographic group responsible for that. But the interesting thing is, and this really gets at the whole broader question of the working class and the Democrats' relationship or, or lack thereof to that group, is that if you look and compare 2012 to 2020, the Obama election to the election of Joe Biden, they're about the same popular vote margin. But what's interesting is the working class as a whole moves away from the Democrats, because what you see between 2016 and 2020 is not just continued poor performance among the white working class, but a cratering, relatively speaking, of support for Democrats among particularly Hispanic working class voters. You had overall like probably a 16 point decline in the Democratic advantage among Hispanic voters, and it was larger among working class Hispanic voters who are you know, 75 to 80 percent of Hispanic voters, so obviously very significant. And then if you compare 2012 to 2020, again, people think of the working class moving away from the Democrats, primarily about white voters. But you compare non-white working class voters in 2012 to the same group in 2020, there's like an 18 point margin shift against the Democrats among this group. So you have a overall move of the working class from different base levels of support for the Democrats toward the Republicans. And we're continuing to see that in 20, 2022. We can look at the data as it's evolving in this election. We have a, you know, just a big chasm between overall working class support and overall college-educated support for the Democrats. They're almost mirror images of each other. Democrats do much better among the college-educated, much worse among the working class. So the immediate question about that, is that those are just the numbers, and mm-hmm. we've seen that, and we've talked about that. The question I would ask is why? What are they telling opinion pollsters, and what are the things that are driving this change? What is it about Democrats they don't like anymore, mm-hmm. and what is it about Republicans that they now suddenly have fallen in love with? Well, I think that... Locution falling in love might not be exactly the right one here, but they're certainly willing to give them a try, and they certainly are disenchanted with the Democrats. I think there are two big reasons for it. 
I mean, one big reason is that culturally the Democrats have become much more left than they used to be, much more focused on identity politics issues, much weaker on issues like crime and immigration, consumed with seemingly arcane ideological debates about race and gender, even insisting on the kind of language you use, uh, and sort of devoting a lot of attention to issues that for a lot of working class voters are just not that salient, and it doesn't certainly doesn't reflect their cultural views. So we have a situation where moderate to conservative working class voters increasingly do not see the Democrats as speaking the same language and having the same worldview as they do. They sort of in a bub- their, their bubble on the coast or wherever they happen to be, and they're you know, worried about things that just really never cross the mind of a lot of working class voters. That's the cultural part of it. But then the economic part of it is very important as well. Obviously, the two things meld together. If you look at the long-term trends affecting working class people in the United States, they have not been good. And they weren't good throughout the 2010s, you know, in that long, painful recovery from the Great Recession. And this affected working class voters all over the country. And they felt that Democrats... They may have liked Barack Obama. They may have liked some of the things he did. But in the end, a lot of these communities were not doing well. In fact, they'd been torn asunder by, you know, the economic changes that have happened in the country, the impact of globalization, the decline of industry and the Rust Belt. But they could have have blamed Republicans for that, too. They could have, but the Democrats were in charge and the Democrats were associated, for example, a lot with a trade regime that they didn't appreciate in terms of uh, its effect on on sort of communities all over the country, and a sense that Democrats were devoted to an economic philosophy that no longer seemed to put working class people, uh, the health of their communities first, and instead was more concerned with what people in the most dynamic areas of the country were doing, how they were prospering, how people with a lot of education were doing, Uh, and so on and so forth. So the the reason a lot of working class people, I mean, in aggregate then start moving away from the Democrats is culturally, you're not looking down on us as far as I can figure out. And economically, you're not producing for me. My community isn't the same way it used to be. My kids aren't able to get ahead the way they used to be. And you don't seem to be doing anything about it. Okay. So, well, I want to come back to the economics in a minute, but let's, let's just stick on the cultural ones. Sometimes when I say the things you said Mm -hmm. or other people like me say them, some people say that that cultural argument, that that cultural resentment or un lack of connection between working class whites, especially, Mm -hmm. and the democratic sort of cultural elites is all about race. Do you buy that? No, I don't buy that. I mean, I think that was an easy, facile explanation that was very popular in the aftermath of the 2016 election when Mm -hmm. Trump did benefit from that surge of white working class voters. And a very popular explanation for that was racism, xenophobia, resentment, status anxiety. They had a million different names for it. And it was all built on the idea that if you looked at the the raw data, it was true that there was a stronger resentment, so a stronger relationship between something called racial resentment and vote for Trump. And even people switch from Obama to Trump. But the thing about this, the racial resentment variable and a lot of variables like that is the question is, what do they really mean? What does it really mean when people say, you know, Irish and Italians got, you know, were able to get ahead by working hard. Black people should be able to do the same. What, is, what does that really mean? And it, it turns out that if you actually like drill down into that set of questions and replace blacks with like Lithuanians or Nepalese or, you know, Surinamese, you get the same response. And so what it is, it's a reflection of people's sense that the rules no longer apply in the way they used to be, that everybody doesn't. The point is everybody should have an equal chance to get ahead. Everyone has a chance to get ahead. And if they don't, it's because of broad barriers that affect everybody, not just a particular race. That sort of sentiment that was captured by racial resentment or those variables was not really what people thought. Instead, it's a, you know, a lot of these things, they tap a generic conservative view toward what the avenues to social mobility are. You work hard, you play by the rules, you do, you know, you get your education, do whatever you, you need to do to get ahead. And if you don't, there's some individual responsibility involved there. And that's a lot what those views are, those kind of variables are tapping. And in fact, if you, you look at the, um, again, the underlying data between 2012 and 2016, most of these indicators went in the wrong direction. People became less racially resentful, not more racially resentful. So how good an explanation is that mm-hmm. for right. what happened in 2016? And I think that gets back to 
the fact that that explanation pushed in an open door among liberals and Democrats because they could not believe anyone would vote for Donald Trump, who is not fundamentally a racist or a xenophobe or benighted or, you know, basically, uh, you know, part of a fading part of history we should seek to pu- push away. Um, they just couldn't get it. So is th- that explanation as it gained force, really hegemonized the Democratic Party. They didn't want to understand why someone might want to vote for Donald Trump. So wait, wait, what you're saying is that explanation made it worse. Absolutely, it made it worse. They got it wrong, and then they said it was about that, and it turns out people who aren't racist don't like being called racist. People who aren't racist, or at any rate, their views are much more complicated than I don't like black people Mm -hmm. or I don't like immigrants. They like people are complex. The way they view the world is is filtered through a lot of different things. They think about things they've heard about, anecdotes they've encountered, you know, their own lives. I mean, they're trying to make sense of the world. And if their sense of the world is, you know, things don't seem fair anymore. It seems like people are cutting in line. It seems like I'm not getting the breaks I did. And maybe some of that's involved, you know, sort of reflects how they feel about immigrants for example, but that doesn't mean they, they literally hate immigrants or they literally don't think there should be any immigrants or literally hate black people. It's much more complex than that. And when you adopt the view that if you have any of these, you know, if you voted for a guy like Donald Trump, prima facie evidence, you are a racist. I mean, this is, this is not going to convince any of them to come back your way. Mm-hmm. It's going to push them away. And believe me, they can tell. I mean, voters know how a lot of Democratic elites look at them and they don't like it. They don't like it at all. And, you know, until that changes, I think Democrats are going to have a lot of difficulties with these voters. And now now actually, you know, bleeding out into Hispanic class voters as well. Right. Well, we'll come back. Hispanics maybe is something to come back at again. But I now just turning to the flip side of it, because, you know, all of uh, there's some interest in this topic because of the political benefits to Republicans, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Uh, But but. On the other side, college-educated affluent voters seem to me, you know, long in the past, people of that affluence, that that elite stature, they would have been more likely to be Republicans. Right. And so I just wondered, I haven't asked you this before, and I haven't seen your writing on this. Maybe you don't focus on this, Mm -hmm. but what happened to them? Why have they become so democratic or or progressive? What is it? Something about our education system? Is it what's going on there? Well, that's a good question. And we, you know, I don't think we all still have a full explanation for this sort of realignment among this demographic. I mean, it does go back quite a ways, at least for part of this demographic. If you look at professionals, uh, for example, they've really realigned toward the Democrats over a lengthy period of time, starting in the 80s and 90s. You see professionals going from being a Republican group to being a basically pro-Democratic group. And then the broader college-educated group takes a longer time to along, and it does appear to have a lot to do with the issues that are associated with Democrats and are associated with Republicans. If you have a sort of series of views on sociocultural issues that tend to be moderate to liberal, and you associate the Republicans with being intolerant, you know, sort of racially biased, xenophobic, whatever, I mean, those things tend to loom large in your view. And, you know, sort of you get to the point where you think that, you know, enlightened college educated people should believe X about Y and you associate, you know, X with the Democratic Party, you're going to be more likely to to go with that party. And, and secondarily, this gets back to the economics of it, right? If you look at how the economic trends that have affected college educated and working class people in this country, they've been to the advantage of college educated people, particularly in the thriving metropolitan areas of the country. So, Unlike working class people who might associate the Democrats with not producing for them, college educated people see the Democrats as actually managing to, you know, run the country in a way that benefits them. I mean, because they're doing relatively well. They're living in places that are cool and hip and they're getting ahead and and they like that. So the Democrats more become their party, the party of, you know, enlightened people like me, enlightened people like me who are doing fairly well in life. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. So I'm, I'm for the Democrats, whereas working class people increasingly, you know, have the reverse point of view. The Democrats are not my people. They're not like me. They don't think like me and they haven't done me a lot of good over the last, you know, 10 or 20 years. So maybe I got to give the Republicans, uh, I got to entertain voting for them. So, uh, one other, we've talked about race and economics and cultural issues. Uh, I want to ask about sexual identity and, gender politics mm-hmm. 
and sort of um, gay marriage and, and things like that, depictions of homosexuals in entertainment. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's a divide in this group of the working class Americans from college educated Americans on those topics? Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, I think one thing that's kind of important to sort of focus on on a question like this is not all college educated people are the same. They may have relatively liberal views on issues having to do with sexuality more so than working class people, but that's not really who's calling the shots in a lot of these culture, cultural conflicts. Those aren't, those are not the people really who are changing the way nonprofits and academia and the arts and so on work. It's more a much smaller sector of those college educated people who are quite liberal. They tend to be younger and they tend to be very bought into what we might call a woke point of view on all these issues, which actually sets them apart, not just from working class people, but probably from your median college educated voter as well, who may vote for the Democrats because they're relatively liberal and they kind of like that. But a lot of this stuff is a bridge too far for them, but they're not the ones who are calling the shots in a lot of these venues. As I sometimes put it, these people these sort of wokish liberal people, they, they control the commanding heights of cultural production. And that's something that not only the working class, working class people aren't calling for, it's something that uh, even the Democratic Party and, um, people aren't calling for, but they, they can't control it, right? I mean, it's, it's literally out of the control. I mean, this sort of cultural juggernaut has rolled through uh, oh, so you're saying, in effect, in effect that, 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 that those commanders of the cultural heights are maybe even driving college educated Americans away from the party that they identify with their with right. Their I think it has the potential to do that. I think right now, given the conflict between the Democrats and Republicans and what Republicans being identified with Trump and so on, I think it's mitigating that possibility. I think it's clearly affecting working class people, but I think it's a ticking time bomb for the Democrats. And I think particularly I would pick out here, you know, the issue of gender identity mm-hmm. and sort of how you treat the whole issue of you know, trans rights and so on. Um, people, all the data suggests people are very nervous about this stuff. They don't really think biological males should be competing in women's sports. They don't really think kids should have access to, you know, puberty blockers and, and surgery. And they're just, they don't believe that, you know, trans women are women, basically. That's a bridge too far for most voters. You know, people have the, I mean, most, the media American voter thinks, you know, and median college educated voter thinks trans People have a right to be whoever the hell they want. But don't tell me yeah. that trans women are exactly the same as women just because they decided yesterday that, you know, I am a woman. I mean, it's like that TikTok star who went and talked to Joe Biden yeah. at the White House, who, who basically is some guy who decided five minutes ago they were a woman and now talks, makes TikTok videos about girlhood and what it all means. I mean, you could not make this stuff up, Robert. Yes, I mean, yes, how yes. crazy is this? It's, so. Yeah. So this is definitely not in the working class wheelhouse. And I don't even think it's in the wheelhouse of many, many millions of college educated voters. And I think the Democrats sort of caught up in this cultural whirlwind that's taken over. That's it's really, you know, redefined our culture in many ways is is really much to their detriment and is going to put a real ceiling on their support. Why why are they? These are your friends. I mean, these are your the Democrats. I I was teasing you a little bit, but why are they letting that happen to them? Why are they? committing this self damage? That, that is a very good question. And I might take a moment here to plug the book I'm writing with John Judas, where have all the Democrats gone, come out next year, where we're going to try to unpack and really understand all that stuff. Because it really is a great question, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, this seems clearly like political malpractice and it's something they don't have to do. They can still be the relatively tolerant liberal party without you know, embracing this sort of outre stuff. But they, they feel compelled to do so. So why is that? I think part of it is, you know, there's a serious amount of preference falsification going on within democratic circles. There's tons of people who say they believe this stuff when they do not. And why are they mm-hmm. falsifying their preferences? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of being attacked on Twitter. They're afraid of other attacks on social media. They're afraid of what their donors are going to say, because a lot of these rich donors are bought into this stuff too. And there's a whole confluence of things that are pushing them to accept and do things they don't even really believe in that they might question the political efficacy of. And then I think part of the problem is you do this long enough, right? You accede to these seemingly absurd positions that you're supposed to take. And after a while, you kind of believe them. 
You know, it's like, well, okay, maybe, maybe that is the way the world is. Or you're just so trapped, you don't even realize you're trapped, which I, is my view of Joe Biden. Well, does a lot of these things, I think, because, you know, the staff tells him to do it. And that's what all the kids are into these days. And, you know, well, who am I as an old dude yeah. to say, you know, I think that seems crazy to me. I mean, a, you know, it's like civil rights, I guess, kind of sort of baby. Yeah. I think is a travesty. But I think that 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 is definitely has an effect on on a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's fair to say Joe Biden didn't find the TikTok star himself. <laughs> Seems like but, yeah, he didn't reach out to yeah. his staff. I didn't get to talk to that woman. Yeah. yeah, but I'm curious. I mean, if there's kind of this realignment happening and um, you're seeing more kind of affluent college educated voters going to the Democrats, is that potentially a winning electoral strategy for them? Or is this kind of a like wake up call that, you know, these pollsters need to see these numbers and realize that they can't afford to bleed these working class voters? Well, I would certainly say the latter. I mean, I think the default option for the Democrats has been this could be and will be a winning strategy for us because we're going to do so well among these sectors of voters who still like us, this sort of rising American electorate, that it's essentially going to defray any losses we have on the other side. We're going to come out net as net winners in this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very risky proposition. Working class voters vastly outnumber college educated voters in this country. And the only reason Democrats have been able to keep their heads above water to some extent is because you know they still get some percentage of the white working class vote and mostly because they could rely on overwhelming support among non-white working class voters. Once you start to bleed those voters, the political mm -hmm. arithmetic just does not work. Yeah. And I think that is really starting to you know, get the attention of a lot of Democratic consultants and pollsters and, yeah. and eventually some Democratic politicians. And I think depending on how 2022 turns out, mm -hmm. uh, I think there may be some uh, you know, rethinking. Uh, Do you see lines. that as kind of like the focus on abortion that has been the Democratic strategy throughout midterms? Like, would you describe that as also kind of a, a focus on a culture war issue that is not necessarily something working class people are going to vote on? Like, was that a miscalculation? That does seem like that's been their main push for people to turn out in midterms. Yeah, I mean, clearly the Democrats a while ago decided they were going to run you know, the 2022 election cycle on abortion rights, gun control, and January 6th, mm -hmm. right? I mean, sort of this trifecta, which, you know, oddly has, not so oddly, has nothing to do with the actual right. economic and material situation most people are experiencing or they're very unhappy about. But I think they figured that in a midterm election, we're going to turn out so many of these voters who are concerned about these issues, who skew heavily toward the college educated and the more liberal, that it's going to allow us to do much better than we thought, you mm -hmm. know, initially we'd be able to do. And I think that was after the Dobbs decision came down, it looked like it was you know, maybe sort of working. I mean, they closed mm -hmm. the generic congressional gap. Um, it looked like Republican advances in the House were going to be really kept to a minimum. And some Mark people, Molinaro some wrote, crazy people were even race. talking about Republicans, you know, they're going to, Democrats are going to keep the House. And, you know, the, uh, the odds are now in favor of us keeping the Senate, like two to one. So uh, the blooms off of that rose. It's now looking a little bit more like a conventional midterm election where people don't like the incumbent administration. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly looking, to my mind, looking at the underlying polling data uh, that we're going to see an increased education polarization in this election where they're going to be even worse among working class voters, but somewhat better among college educated voters. That's going to net out to the disadvantage of Democrats because, again, you know, most people in this country do not have a four year bachelor's degree. They mm -hmm. just do not. Yeah. And that's going to affect your uh, your your political welfare all over the country. Mm -hmm. So, Rui, you wrote a book, The Emerging Democratic Majority. And which we've some been of this ironic. <laughs> and we've been talking about the extent to which that emerging Democratic majority didn't emerge. Mm -hmm. And what was it about? I mean, I think the the easy, flippant interpretation of your book, and I may have this completely wrong, mm -hmm. was that you based the emerging Democratic majority on a truism that you never said was true, which was that that, that minorities will always vote Democratic and, and never break with the Democratic Party because they all think a certain way or whatever. What I, 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 that's what I thought people interpreted your book to be, was that demographics is destiny right, right. in American politics, and demographics, as America got browner and, and more minority population, they would become more left or more democratic. But that's not what you really wrote, I don't think. And, and so what yeah. happened to that thesis, and, and, and how would you get back to an emerging democratic majority um, 
given what's happened. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, our view certainly was more complex than that. We talked about a number of factors, not just the growth of the non-white population, but also we talked about the emerging democratic strength in the more dynamic metropolitan areas. We talked about the realignment of professionals to the Democratic Party. We talked about changes in very large sectors of women voters who are making them more pro-democratic. And we put that in the context of the way we felt Democrats were a little more closer to like the emerging center of gravity of the country in terms of public opinion and preferences is sort of what we called progressive centrism. So our thought was that if Democrats could take those trends, they could stick to a sort of progressive centrism and critically, and this was totally ignored, that they could keep a strong share of white working class voters, that they wouldn't have too much deterioration among that demographic because at the time we we wrote the book, there were still probably 46, 47 percent of American voters that th- this could work as a formula. And, you know, so far, I mean, we, we could we were looking at the trends and thinking this could continue for quite a while. But this was always in the context of it being a potential. None of this stuff was, you know, set in stone. As you pointed out, there was no guarantee that all nine wa- non-white voters would continue to vote Democratic at the rates they previously had. There's always room for attrition, especially when you deviate from what had been a previously successful formula, which I think they did. I mean, Obama was kind of, 2008 was the high point yeah. mm-hmm. of, that, of that coalition, of that potential. He really did show it. He really did perform so well in all those emerging demographics. He did relatively well among white working class voters. But it was all downhill from there. 2020, the Democrats get wiped out. I mean, particularly among white working class voters. Again, 2012, Obama claws back some of those white working class voters. He runs actually a relatively populist campaign, which people now forget about. But after 2012, people completely lost those lessons. They thought, oh, well, you know, Obama was all about the rising American electorate. It was all about those things John Judas and Rui Deshera talked about on their books. So all we got to do is put the pedal to the metal on that and not worry about this other stuff. And it, that really turned out to be a predicate, I think, for the Democratic defeat in 2016, as he didn't understand how important the white working class vote was, how tenuous their hold was on a reasonable share of it, because they thought they could overwhelm that problem with these sort of rising constituencies uh, upon, within which they thought they would always do well. In 2016, that didn't turn out that well. In 2020, they underperformed largely because they started losing votes, even among some of those constituents they thought would always be with them at the same level. So there's, there's so many moving parts here and always a tendency for people to take any complicated argument you make and reduce it to the one simple thing they want to believe. Yeah. They want to believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. One of the things you've spoken about or mentioned, and, and you and I have had a side conversations about it, was a, was a Democratic politician who I think you think or maybe I'm wrong, but I thought your attraction to him as a sort of historical study was Robert Kennedy because of his popularity with both blacks and working class whites. Mm -hmm. And is that right? And and is that the kind of um, democratic progressive centralist politician that you think could recapture that coalition or put it back together for Democrats? Not that I'm trying to give them advice, but Uh what, what is it about Robert Kennedy that makes you think sort of look over and say, well, why didn't, why aren't Democrats more like him? That might help them. Well, he started from, you know, a fundamental premise that working class people have a lot of interests in common and you need to appeal to all sectors of the working class. And, and it is possible. I mean, not just that you should, but it's possible. He believed that America was a place where you could bring the multiracial working class together behind, you know, sort of a program that would benefit you know, sort of people across races who were poor working class and what have you and, and middle class as well. And he believed that. And I think he bodied that to some extent, I think. And he was willing to put his chips on that idea. And in a way, if you look at the evolution of the Democratic Party ever since 1968, in an odd sort of way, it's a, it's a gradual sort of falling away from that Bobby Kennedy perspective about the need to make the centrality of appealing to the multiracial working class. I mean, Democrats become more enamored of other constituencies. They become increasingly annoyed with working class people who don't think they're great and therefore must, you know, be sort of, sort of on the wrong side of history. And, you know, the, the whole idea that 
you know, Democrats should fundamentally be universalist and appeal to the multiracial working class as opposed to picking and choosing which constituencies they appeal to really comes out of, you know, sort of falls out of favor over time. But I think the, Ken, the Bobby Kennedy formula is actually a very good formula. And I think realistically for the Democrats to, you know, reemerge, as it were, as any kind of really dominant majority party is just as opposed to participating in this sort of unpleasant stalemate between the parties that I think we're really experiencing today. I think it does include an attempt to revive that spirit, at least, of how you're going to appeal to the multiracial working class. And that's central. You're not just about the non-white working class. You're not about the white working class. You're about the working class and, you know, poor people and middle class people as a whole. And you're going to uplift them all. And that's really what America is all about. Universal mm-hmm. uplift. Upward mobility for everybody. Well, I, I would suggest that there were other aspects about his p- political persona that also, s- looking back now, seem out of out of touch with the sort of democratic politicians today. Mm-hmm. He seemed more patriotic. He seemed more willing, and had a, had had done been in circumstances where he would disagree with with. Um, black politicians that, that were doing things he didn't agree with. And, and he wanted to support them and he helped them. He certainly was a great advocate for uh, racial equality and, and voting rights and all those things and a great hero of the black population. But he wouldn't always say yes. And I think that the white working class saw that. Willing, he was also a law and order person. He, right. he, no question he was a law and order person. The other thing that just struck me is, I mean, you know, I, I'm trying to think of a current Democratic politician who was so overtly religious and Catholic. Mm-hmm. President Biden is Catholic, I know, but but it's Bobby Kennedy was he had 11 children for God's sakes. I mean, right, right. is it possible that that there's some cultural issues involving Robert Kennedy that make him less like today's Democrats and more like working class Americans who are turning right. toward Republicans? Well, I think, yes, he was an unapologetic, patriotic American, which I think is something that a lot of Democrats are now loath to identify mm-hmm. themselves as because that's, you know, it sort of covers up the, the, the terrible aspects of our history and the awful things we've done. And, you know, I, I think Bill Clinton had it about right. There's nothing, you know, wrong with America that can't be fixed by what's right with America. And that is absolutely the approach that Democratic politicians need to take. They need to uplift America, identify with being American and, you know, bring Americans together because that's that's what they want. And Kennedy understood that. Kennedy understood that, you know, crime is an issue that affects everybody. And if you appear to be soft on crime, if you appear to be tolerant of a deterioration of public safety and of urban blight and of neighborhoods nobody wants to walk through, nobody wants that. Black, white or polka dots. Nobody wants that. And you have to be unapologetic about that commitment. And part of what's happened to the Democratic Party over time is they become really reticent about leaning into those very common sort of sentiments that almost everybody has, Mm -hmm. regardless of their race in in this country. Everybody, you know, like everybody is, you know, sort of people like America. (laughs) There's just no other way to put it. I mean, people are patriotic. The only people who really aren't patriotic in this country are people who identify as progressive activists Mm -hmm. who are like, actually, if you've literally asked them, are you proud to be American? Only about a third of them will say yes. But you look across all races, all classes, I mean, you get like overwhelming majorities saying they're proud to be an American, they're patriotic. So that's really a problem because the problem is these progressive activists uh, who loom large in the democratic mm-hmm. world, they, 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 they ID it, they, they affect the democratic image and the Democrats need a different image. They need more like the Bobby Kennedy image to get back to what you were talking about. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that finding and that you just said it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really quite Patriotism. extraordinary. Mm-hmm. I'm curious also, I mean, as you've looked at, we've talked about a lot of different groups, but it just seems striking to me that there's been such a, a decrease in kind of religiosity in America at the same time that on the left, politics has become like how most people express kind of their morals or values. Do you think there's a link there? Like, is did politics kind of used to be not really essential to like us being good people or kind of who we are. And now that, you know, people aren't getting that from religion or church or other communities, they're investing all of that in their political identity. I think there's, yes, I think there's truth to that. I mean, we can debate about how much, but it is, Mm -hmm. it is hard to miss the similarity between how a lot of people 
deal with their political affiliations and their sort of ideology around their politics and not think of religion because it does become a catechism. It does become, you know, a way in which you deal with everything and how you look at everybody and how you deal with any news event. I mean, it's all seen through this lens where there's our side and there's the other side. And if you deviate, if you're, you know, (laughs) if you exhibit a heretical point of view Mm -hmm. on a lot of these issues, I mean, like we were talking about the trans issue, for example, I mean, there's, no way to understand a lot of Democrats commitment to the trans issue without sort of bringing in a sort of like part of the religion. Mm-hmm. I mean, trans women are women, you know, to, to express otherwise is to be a bigot. I mean, it's, it's to deviate from the doctrine, right? So I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think it would be, we'd be better off politically in this country if more people left or right weren't so quasi religious about their, about their uh, political beliefs and their ideology. And yeah, it may have something to do with people filling the gap mm-hmm. from the decline of actual, you know, conventional religious affiliation. I'm, I'm open to that idea. Mm-hmm. I don't know how we put that genie back in the box, but I would just say if people don't want to be religious, then, you know, maybe they shouldn't be religious about their politics either. Mm-hmm. Okay. So last question, you know, it's, this has been a great conversation and, and you are, all the things we thought you were. Uh, But the question is, given your long history in studying these issues, what, what are you focusing on now? What, what is the, what is, you mentioned a new book, but what, Mm -hmm. what do you, what do you want to find out more? What, what are you, tell me about your life as a scholar. What, what's, what is, are your sources? What's, what's your, your agenda? Well, you know, as Lenin said, quoting Goethe, theory is gray, but the tree of life is everlasting green. So, I try to really focus on what's going on in my society today, look at the political and social trends, try to put them all together, and try to understand more how the American people are evolving in the way they are and how, you know, the different coalitions that now underpin both parties uh, are evolving and what they really consist of. Because I think a lot of misunderstanding and poor thinking about politics comes from not understanding these coalitions, not understanding the groups that make up, and they're actually existing opinions about things, not the opinions you think they hold or you want them to hold, but the, the ones they do have. And I'm doing a, Yuval Levin and, and I are now working on a project. We're going to do a study of party coalitions, and we're going to include a big survey um, starting at the beginning of next year. And we're really going to try to unpack the evolving role of party coalitions in America, the roles they previously played, and also, like, what do we have now? How can, un- how can understanding party coalitions today and how they're structured and the different groups that compose them and their sort of different vectors of beliefs, how can that illuminate the sort of s- stalemate we're in now politically between the parties? And will it suggest any openings for either party to move in a direction that's more productive and getting our politics back to something we'd, we'd all be proud of participating in? Okay, so, so I know I said that was the last question, but I do have mm-hmm. one more. So we talked about the progressive left, and we've talked about the broad middle, mm-hmm. a lot of this conversation. But are you worried about the extreme right uh, and, and democracy? Yeah, I'm worried about it. I mean, I do think that as much as I criticize the Democrats, I mean, there is a contingent of the extreme right who's represented in the Republican Party that seems a bit skeptical of the value of democracy, shall we say, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, worse might be willing to act on it. And I think that here the figure of Donald Trump looms large because let's face it, um, this guy still packs a big punch and he's sort of associated with the people in the Republican party who seem most cavalier about, you know, democracy and about whether we need our to institutions, love institutions, America, patriotism yeah. even. I mean, it, th- this is a bad thing. And I think that, uh, you know, that's why even though the Democrats have multiple problems that I've outlined in, in, in some detail in my writings and in our talk here today, I think the Republicans are equally incapable at this point of governing the country in a good way and of avoiding their own extremists. And, and in fact, you know, they have elements of their own party which really could endanger democracy, democratic institutions, democratic rule if they get too much power. Now, that said, I do think that there is a tendency in democratic ranks to like act like we're basically the Weimar Republic 1932 and like the Republican Party, a literal fascist or a big part of it is lit. And I think that's just really overwrought. 
I mean, if you want to defeat the people who are undermining our democratic norms and are at least raising the possibility of undemocratic practices, then you, you basically need to realize that most people in this world do not live their day to day thinking about how they're going to like fight fascism. They're really thinking about how they can get ahead. They're thinking about their health care. They're thinking about the economy. They're thinking about what would be decent, humane politics that I could relate to. And I think you need to realize that uh, and realize that if you want to defeat the people who are seemingly most anti-democratic on the Republican side, then you literally have to beat them in election contests. And that involves more than just pillaring uh, them and their party for being, you know, a, a sort of fifth column in the United States for a fascist takeover. Because I just think that's, it's way overwrought. I mean, everybody hated, at least I hated what happened in 2020 with Trump's attempt to like mess with the outcome of the election, but the system held. Let's, let's celebrate that. You know, let's build on that. I mean, America's a, not only has a great country, it has an institutional structure that is really capable of, of, of resisting a lot of, a lot of damage. And we should, we should sort of try to lift that up for people and say, if we, you know, if we work hard, we can keep the system uh, working. We can keep these bad elements in check. And if you agree with me, then, you know, you should be with me. And besides, I'm going to do all this other great stuff for you, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, but I think hanging it all on, you know, the fascists are at the gates, just a very questionable mm -hmm. political strategy. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, listeners. This has been a great conversation. Rui, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phoebe, thank you. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the discussion today. Please remember to subscribe and rate the podcast. Feel free to send us any feedback or suggestions at banter at AEI.org.